please stand for the reading of God's word. I'm reading from Matthew 5, verses 27 through 32. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, thank you, Samantha, and uh, wow, so as you can tell from our scripture reading this morning, we are going to touch on some sensitive topics, and that's always a little dangerous when you're the pastor, and so uh, this required much prayer, and uh, the word uh, I'm going to share with you went through as much refinement as I could, as I could get to <laughs> in a week's time, so... So uh, I think it's good just to pray before we start our message this morning. Let's, let's lift up a prayer to the Lord. Father God, you are gracious to us and you are faithful to us. Lord, that we would be faithful to you as you are faithful to us. And that uh, you show us steadfast love. May we love you back as you love us. And may we love our neighbor as ourselves, Father. Please guide us. In the study of your word today, and we come to you with humble hearts, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So, um, the last couple weeks, we have been considering Jesus' words with regard to the commandments found in the Mosaic Law. Uh, And you'll remember early on in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus is very emphatic. He did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, rather he came to fulfill them. And when he says fulfill them, it's to bring the law to its, to its highest meaning or its greatest understanding. Now last week we looked at the sixth commandment. Uh, Luke showed us uh, or shared with us from the scriptures about the sixth commandment. Anyone know what commandment number six is? Thou shall not what? Murder. Murder. You should not kill. Number six, don't get your kicks by killing one another, right? So there we go. That's right. You shall not murder. It's a prohibition against murder. And you know, Jesus teaches that um, not committing murder falls short of keeping the commandment. Um, it's, it's, It's not a matter of simply not murdering. There's something deeper there. And so Jesus brings the law to its highest meaning or highest expression when when he claims that if you're even angry at your brother or you say words of contempt against your brother, you're guilty of this commandment. Because to to be angry or to give words of contempt or, uh, or contempt is basically saying, look, the world would be better off if you just weren't here, which is which is murder by, at least in spirit, I suppose, murder by principle. So we're beginning to understand something. And maybe I could have the gentleman back put up the, uh, put up our uh, slide presentation here this morning. Uh, Jesus is starting to dig at something here. Um, God is not satisfied with outward observances of the law. But God desires an inward obedience to the law. God is concerned about the condition of the heart. All right, so let's, there we go. Because if the heart is right, then your behavior will also be right. Um, All sinful activity is first spawned in the heart. 
And so God wants your heart. He wants that as a first priority because he knows if he has your heart, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, your behavior toward God and toward others will be right. That's why, that's why Jesus says this is the first and greatest commandment. You've got to love God. So this week, this week we're moving from the sixth commandment to the seventh commandment. And what's the seventh commandment? Thou shall not commit adultery. Number seven, life is heaven when you're true to your mate, as the song goes. So the seventh commandment gives a prohibition against adultery. And so we need to begin our our message this morning by uh, defining adultery. What is adultery? What is being said here? Well, in its most strict sense, adultery is the act of being unfaithful toward your wife or your, or your husband. And it's typically understood as the act of a husband or a wife having sexual relations with someone other than their spouse. Okay, that's the strict definition of adultery. And so, before we move forward... Permit me to say a few words about love, okay? God, have you ever thought about this? God has blessed humans with the ability not just to feel the emotion of love, but to express that love with activity. Have you ever thought about that? That's that's really quite astounding if you think about it. Not only can I feel love, but I can express it with the things I do. And there's something about love, and I I know that's not a surprise to all of you. There's something about love, isn't there? Um, There's there's something about love. We'll call it a drive, okay, that's not satisfied until it reaches its highest expression, until it's fulfilled, similar to what Jesus is doing to the law, right? There's there's that drive, and and it's just not satisfied until it's fulfilled. And, And how is that heart fulfilled? How is that drive satisfied? It's satisfied when the lover achieves unity with the beloved, right? Where lovers are continually together. When lovers are now locked into a a mutual and common vocation, whether it's raising a family or building a home, uh, there's, there's mutual emotional fulfillment. There's care, and there's, there's encouragement, and there's, there's passion, right? There in, there in that love. And, and so the highest expression of the activity of love is that physical union between a man and a woman. And so why do I say that? I say that Because God holds this activity in the highest regard. Not only is that activity intended to satisfy that soul's desire for unity, it is, and catch this, it is also the only activity on the face of the earth that brings about new human life. Isn't that astounding? God used an expression of love to bring about new life, right? I believe God, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we can understand, we can understand why the Bible would prohibit adultery because it becomes very personal, something very deep, something very connecting. And to share physical intimacy with someone other than your spouse is to tear away at that unity to cast asunder that which the Lord has put together. But I believe there's another reason why God would hold this in such high regard. Is that the unity between a husband and a wife also gives us a picture of salvation. God loves us. And through the activity of love, he grants us new life so that we can be unified with him forever. Did you catch that parallel there? I 
And I believe this is the parallel that Paul makes in Ephesians chapter 5. So again, it's easy to see why the commandment is here. But I think we have to be honest. The strict definition of adultery uh, sets the bar pretty low, okay? And it leads to a host of questions. And, And I'm going to ask just a few of these questions. I hope this doesn't get uncomfortable, okay? So bear with me, okay? Here here we go. Here we go. Question number one. If a husband or a wife becomes emotionally intimate with someone other than his or her spouse, but not physically intimate, would that be adultery? You don't have to answer that. Question number two. What if my sexual behavior apart from myself does apart from my spouse doesn't directly involve another person? Would that be adultery? What if my sexual behavior apart from my spouse uh, kind of falls short of that activity which would technically produce more children? Would that be adultery? And right now I've been talking about married couples can can a single person, can an unmarried person be guilty of this and commit adultery? Now, I'm not going to ask any more questions because the more questions I ask, the more I would have to begin to explain what I mean and the more I'd have to explain, the less age-appropriate my message becomes. (laughs) And I don't want to go there. But I think you get the picture, don't you? you? You get the picture. That um, that it would be easy to rationalize certain behaviors and say, "Oh, that's really that's not really adultery." Do you see where it might be easy to rationalize? Um, so where do we draw the line? How do we draw the line? What do we do with all this? Well. Jesus has the solution for us. Praise God, right? Jesus has the solution for us. And he says this in verse 28. He says, Everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, you'll notice Jesus here makes a similar move to as he did with the, with the commandment against murder. Refraining from the actual act of adultery only consists of or constitutes the very baseline conformance with the law, right? Only the the, the ground level door, if you will. To fill up the law to its highest meaning, Jesus says that the man who looks at a woman with lustful intent, that that is guilt. That man is guilty of the commandment. So let's analyze this here in just a little more depth. And I'm going to let that sink in for a moment while I grab a quick drink of water. The first point of my analysis is the term lustful intent. What is lustful intent? Well, this is the condition where a heart longs for or imagines physical intimacy with someone else. Okay, pretty simple. And, and notice Jesus gives the case where a man looks upon a woman with lustful intent. Do you think it's right for Jesus to single out men here? Didn't he know that we would read this passage in the 21st century where Western culture believes that men and women are essentially the same? Didn't he know that? Well, certainly he knew we would read this in the 21st century. And certainly Jesus knows that men and women are not essentially the same. <laughs> and I'm going on record by saying that. So cancel culture, bring it on. Right? <laughs> bring it on. Um, I believe Jesus is deliberate here. I believe he's deliberate because he knows men and women are not the same. Men are more visually driven than women, and men need a greater degree of physical intimacy to experience that unity that we talked about, that unity that that drives the heart, okay? Um, so, So men tend to be more susceptible, and men tend to be more guilty, 
uh, of, uh, of exercising lustful intent than women. And, and I think to deny this is just to, is to be biblically and intellectually dishonest, okay? And all I have to do is remember the news over the last 12 months, okay? And what we've seen in the news over the last 12 months is that the president of the largest Christian university in the country, the mayor of our city, and an internationally known apologist have all fallen on this point, okay? And, and what do they have all in common? They're all men, okay? So men, we're, we're, we're guilty, right? We've got a problem here, okay? Ah, uh, yes, we've got, and you know, I hate, I, I hate standing up and saying these things because guess what? <laughs> I'm a man, right? And so I've got this problem too. It's, if, I'm not, if, if I am not guilty of this now, certainly at some point in my life, I've been guilty of this. And, and look, if I took a poll, okay, every man in the room would be guilty as well. Okay. So uh, we need to call a spade a spade. Um, but although I think Jesus is right in targeting men here, I, I, that does not relieve a woman from responsibility or relieve her from being guilty of this commandment either, okay? If a woman looks upon a man and longs or imagines for emotional intimacy with someone who is not her spouse, she is also guilty, okay? So violation of the seventh commandment truly is a heart issue. It truly is a heart issue. Whereas the teaching of the commandment sets the bar very low, Jesus sets this bar extremely high. And I, you know what's funny about this? Jesus leaves out the qualifier of being married, okay? He just says, if you are a man, if you're a man and you look upon a woman with lustful intent, you're guilty. Regardless, if this gal is not your wife, you're guilty. You're guilty. And I think further he's implying that uh, before any kind of illicit behavior occurs, there must be first the thought or the idea. Again, the heart precedes the action. We are not to let our minds run away with our our hearts. And so, so that settles it. If you're a man, whether married or not, and you look upon a woman who is not your wife with lustful intent, you are guilty of breaking this commandment. And Jesus fills up the law to its highest meaning. And so where does this leave us? Okay? Because just as everyone has been angry at somebody, so also everyone is guilty of this. Why is Jesus saying this? Well, Jesus wants us to understand that we're the very types of people that he mentions in the Beatitudes. We're the, we're the poor in spirit. We are, he wants to stir up within us hunger and thirst for righteousness. He wants us to be pure in heart. He wants us to mourn over our sin so that we would come to the king. That's what he wants. Now after this, Jesus says some very Uh, shocking statements, uh, very uh, interesting words here. Let's, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, then tear it out and throw it away. Or if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Uh, In the scriptures, the right hand or the right eye was the most valuable. Because that's usually the dominant hand or the dominant eye. And, and apologies to you left-handers out there. It's just, you know, 75% of us are right-handed. That's just the way it goes. So apologize. Anyway, the, the idea is not just throw away something dear to you, that most dear and most precious to you. And, and I don't think that Jesus is mincing words here. I think there's a reason why he uses hand and eye. For it's the eye that is used to look upon a woman with lustful intent, and it's the hands that are used to actually carry out the physical act of adultery. So what are we to make of these passages? Is is Jesus really instructing us to maim ourselves if our hands or eyes engage in sin? Is he really saying that we should amputate our bodies 
so that we are spared from, from the fire of hell. Is that what he's really saying? Because if that's what he's really saying, we better start cutting, right? right? Christians will look like this. Right? <laughs> we'll all be cut up and maimed. So, but we're not. No, I, and I don't think Jesus is saying that. I think what Jesus is underscoring is the severity and the seriousness of sin. And he's underscoring the need for us to sever those, those places, those people, those activities which would cause us and entice us to sin. Cut them away and throw them out. I believe that's what he's saying here. I also believe he's saying there's a more sensible way than cutting yourself, right? Go to the king who is rich in righteousness. Now, now, true to form, after this, Jesus brings up another sensitive topic, and it's the topic of, of divorce. And I say this is sensitive because um, I, I think I, I think I am right to say that everyone here knows someone that they love that has gone through a divorce. Uh, and, and you know, it's, and, and maybe there are some here who have experienced divorce, and it is, it is heart-wrenching. It's, it's heart-wrenching to watch someone you love go through a divorce. And so that's why I say it's sensitive. Now, Jesus here brings up the Pharisees' teaching on the subject, and he's referencing a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, the con- uh, that's not the verse I wanted. That's, where am I? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Where's Deuteronomy? There it is. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Um, in this passage of Deuteronomy, this is where a husband discovers some kind of indecency about his wife, something that he didn't know before they got married. And uh, I'm not really able to find any examples in the Bible where... where uh, this passage is applied. Uh, so I could only speculate as to what this indecency might be. Um, but here's something that we can gather from the passage. If, if some kind of indecency is discovered and, and the husband desires to terminate the marriage, he must provide a written certificate of divorce. It needs to be legal and it needs to be established. It can't just be a whim. It it needs to be something official. Now, you'll notice Jesus doesn't quote the entire passage. If if you're familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 4, it's really verses 1 through 4 that touch on this subject. And and Jesus only references verse 1. I think he does this because this is the passage that the Pharisees use to justify their position on the issue. But if we were to investigate the entirety of this passage in in Deuteronomy chapter 24, after the man issues the certificate of divorce, then that gal is permanently off limits to him. He can never go back to that gal and remarry. And so Deuteronomy, in my opinion, satisfies two things. It satisfies the need to address some kind of indecency, which might be serious, Okay, but it also, it also prevents some kind of treachery on the man's part, that he would simply invoke this verse so that, uh, so that he could move on to another gal if, if that's what he so chose to do. Because with this certificate of divorce, this gal can now remarry. And number two, the man really has to think long and hard. Is, is this indecency so egregious that I, I never want to be with this girl again? And so the idea is to mitigate against both. Um, now, it would seem that the Jewish religious leaders began to understand Deuteronomy as God's uh, license to divorce, no matter how small the indecency might be. And by the time we arrive in the first century, Some prominent rabbis taught that a man's desire for divorce could be justified for any and all reasons. And so this is what Jesus is tackling. And we can see here that that the Pharisees' teaching on divorce sets the bar 
very, very low. And Jesus makes the same move as he did with murder and with adultery. He sets that bar very high. And Jesus refutes the idea of divorce for any and all reasons with the provision of allowing divorce for only one reason. And that's for sexual immorality or marital unfaithfulness. Uh, so here, I want to just, um, uh, so, so the word translated for sexual immorality, uh, in your Bible, some of your Bibles will say a fornication, and this word tends to be used specifically when a, a woman is guilty of committing adultery, that, that seems to be the general usage in, in the New Testament, uh, and I want to say out front, this is a very difficult passage to interpret. I went to several commentaries, and each commentary had a different angle on it. And so I, I realized, well, I guess I'm going to have to give you my angle on it. And so you may disagree with my angle, but I'm going to do the best I can to be faithful to God's word and tell it how I see it, okay? Okay. All right. Um, So here in my humble perspective, or again, it's my humble perspective, I'm going to agree that this kind of sexual immorality is the condition where, where a wife has committed adultery. Okay, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to say that. I'm going I'm to just concede that point. In, six, in, 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 this, in this offense, is, is punishable by death, according to the Old Testament. However, if the man so chose... He could put the woman away quietly, similar to what Joseph decided to do with Mary. You remember that? Okay. Um, and I believe that's probably what Jesus would want a man to do, especially in light of what we see in, uh, in John chapter 8 with the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Or you might remember that. I don't have a lot of time to go into that. I, we, we could spend all morning just, just the theology of, of divorce, uh, but I didn't want to go there. Uh, so, now, I'm also going to be so bold as to assume that the product of adultery is that there is a child on the way, okay? So the adultery now has fruit, okay? So for the sake of peace and for the sake of uh, the well-being of the child, the man is given the license of, of divorcing this woman, okay? He's permitted to let her go. And then Jesus says that whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I'm, I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that this new husband that's in the picture is also the father of this child, okay? And so what I believe Jesus is saying is this. Not only is the woman guilty of adultery, so is the the man who she's going to marry to build this new family. Okay, they're both guilty. It's not, it's not a one-way door or a one-way street. Now, permission for divorce is not a mandate for divorce. I think Hosea presents that well in the Old Testament. God can heal a marriage and do good things to a marriage that has suffered adultery. And this requires a, a great deal of um, confession. It requires a great deal of forgiveness. And it might help to realize that we are all, to some extent, guilty of the commandment, of uh, the seventh commandment, not to commit adultery. And we're all guilty of also committing adultery of, of a greater nature. Uh, we've all... We have all allowed our hearts to chase after other things in place of God. We've all let our first love slip from time to time. And the scriptures refer to this as an adultery, if you will, against God. So to forgive the wayward spouse is to, is to forgive and serves as a picture of, uh, of how God has forgiven us. And so... That brings us to the end of our passage this morning. And the big takeaways are these, okay? The heart 
the heart precedes the hands, okay? The intent and the desire precedes the act. And just as anger is the seed to every murder, lustful intent is the seed to every adultery. God wants our hearts. You know, my prayer for our church is that your, your heart longing, that love that drives your heart, is to achieve unity, but to achieve unity with God. To be unified with Him. We're going to live with God forever, right? Unity that satisfies the heart is, is in continual presence with the beloved. And God's going to, we're going to achieve that in glory. But for right now, for right now, we're to be unified with God in common purpose, in serving Him, in having Him as our first love. And if He is our first love, if it's going to guide our behavior. So that's my prayer, that our first love, that we would not forsake our first love, that we would desire unity with our God, that we would love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And we so easily let other things slip in. Oh, I want a better job. Oh, I want better relationships. I want a, I want a better marriage. I want a better this. I want a better that. I, if I just had more of this, all those things push God out. If God if God were that thing that you love the most, those things would seem quite small. I just, I just went on a, a rant there. So anyway, forgive me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that was totally unscripted. So, <laughs> uh, if, our, if our hearts are right, our actions will be right. They'll be in conformance to God. God's not interested in knocking out the symptoms. God wants to get at the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is our hearts. That's where the problem is. Uh, Jesus raises the bar, doesn't he? He raises the bar really. He raises the bar so high that we all stand guilty. And I think he does this purposely. He wants us to come to the king in humility. He wants us to wave the white flag. We surrender. We give up our rebellion. We're coming to you. You're the king with the riches that we need, the righteousness that we need, because we've got none on our own. We need Jesus Christ. So if you've been hurt on account of adultery or on account of divorce, Jesus knows. Jesus knows you're hurt. He does. Okay, he was, he was abandoned by all those who were closest to him, and he hung on the cross alone. He knows. So let's not chase after other gods. Let's, let's be singularly devoted, pure in heart, focusing on Jesus Christ and serving him. So anyway, there we go. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, you are so gracious to us. You are so gracious to us. Uh, I pray, Lord God, for every soul in this church that, that we would love the Lord your God. We would love you with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind, that our deepest desire is to be unified with you. That we would be together with you in common purpose of being a light to the world, salt to the earth. Lord, please guide us and bless us here. We need your help because we stand guilty before you. And I ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.